Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my session. So first, a warning, it will be a little bit tongue-in-cheek uh, because I want to get you to think about not what you are doing, but how you are doing that. And when I was putting this talk together, uh, I was thinking, okay, but there are so many ways to have some sort of impact through our work. I'm never going to fit them into the talk. And then I realized I have only 20 minutes. So, uh, and there's cost of living crisis and everything. So ultimately, I'll have only three ways to have outside impact. <laughs> so I will start with what I'm trying to get to with this talk. First of all, I think we are impacting the scientific ecosystem in more ways than we usually recognize. And I think we should be celebrating that. And the second goal is to, I mentioned that a little, we should be a bit more mindful about how we are doing our work, not just what we are doing. So this is what I will be trying to get to throughout my talk. And to create some sort of change in the world, we, well, I will talk, yeah, without further ado, let's talk into about the three pathways. So first one, I think we are sort of catalysts of a wider change in the scientific ecosystem. And let me tell you a bit more about what I mean by that. I think by caring about software and about well, caring about good software and good software practices, we are bringing this drive more towards robust science, more towards reproducible science. And us being sort of self-interested, we want to share our code, meaning we are catalyzing open science, even if we are not talking about it. And the thing is, the scientists quite often don't really care about the software. So there's quite a lot of for us to do and to have impact through that. But there is this shift towards acknowledging non-paper publications. And you are probably sick of hearing about that because this has been mentioned many times throughout the conference. You can publish things on GitHub, which you probably already do. You can put things on Zenodo to get DOI, to get a citable reference. Uh, you can publish a, a paper in JOS. So there's quite a lot of stuff that we can already do to raise awareness of our software. But in practice, it hasn't propagated throughout the ecosystem yet. This is a plot from Hidden Ref from Simon Hetrick, where they looked at uh, what outputs were submitted into Ref. And of course, the vast majority are paper publications. And the non-publication artifacts, those include other things than just software. So, Thing is, the wider ecosystem doesn't really acknowledge that you can have impact through software. Well, but having impact just through the scientific ecosystem is not everything. Let me change the topic completely. <laughs> so this is a personal story. Back in 2015, I signed up to give a, to do a blog post before Christmas through the F Sharp Advent Calendar which is a initiative community where people sign up to write a blog post on one day leading up to Christmas. So I signed up to do something. I had no idea what I'm going to do, but I had to publish a blog post. And it was a few days before the premiere of Star Wars, The Force Awakens. So everything that everyone was talking about online was Star Wars, at least in my circles. And I thought, okay, can I do something with Star Wars? Well, I decided to download all the screenplays, all the scripts of all the movies that came out before. Uh, this is how they look. And you can see that it's a fairly nicely structured thing. Uh, you have a scene which starts with int or X, meaning interior or exterior. Then there is some description and then the person speaking in that scene is there as a name in bold capitals. Nice, I can parse that. I can put together a few regular expressions. I can find out which characters talk together in a scene and that will create a social network because I can connect them. It's nice. 
By the way, if you ever wondered what regular expression matches all character names in Star Wars, this is it. <laughs> because the names are horrible. <laughs> they include special characters, they include letters. So what I did is I created the Star Wars social network. I published it as a blog post. F Sharp community is fairly niche, so not that many people saw it, but I put it on GitHub and forgot about it because it was right before Christmas. Turns out this is my most real world impactful thing I have ever done. <laughs> because it's a fun data set and people started using it in teaching. I got a random email a few years ago about someone doing research in sharks saying, oh, I'm modeling shark networks and I'm using your data set in my teaching. Like, that's amazing. It made its way into a textbook. Uh, it made its way into a couple of lectures. It appears in papers as an example data set. So ultimately, through something that I didn't even meant to have any kind of impact, I just dumped it on the internet and forgot about it. It really, I believe this is my most impact in the world. <laughs> Uh, so there is quite a lot of stuff we can do through having some sort of community recognition by putting things out there. They don't have to be formal, but if they get out there, people will use them. So this is my appeal for you to publish things, even if you don't think they are immediately useful. And you can publish all sorts of things, as you probably know. You can publish data sets, you can publish benchmarks, you can publish methodologies, standards. Anything. Put it on Zenodo, put it on GitHub, tell people about it. And there's quite a lot of stuff of, uh, of this sort happening in the IRC world as well. You can submit things to Hidden Ref, which is an amazing uh, initiative to recognize precisely the type of impact that doesn't make it official structures. So, and Ref28, you probably heard about that. Now we can submit ourselves things to Ref because we are not academic staff. We are the other university staff. And the, more importantly, the departments can submit also an explanation how uh, the output is creating impact. So there is more variability, more flexibility in actually demonstrating impact. So that's all nice. And I just wanted to tell you that this is a part of a larger shift in the ecosystem. Uh, the society signed the COARA, which is Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, which is a European initiative. It's coming from EU and it's all about pushing uh, or putting in more in forward the sort of non-standard outputs and celebrating the impact that non-researcher staff are happening are having on the ecosystem and about the non-traditional roles etc and i think that the history is on our side it hasn't sort of propagated throughout the whole system but everyone wants to celebrate the type of work that we do so if it's a data set if it's a piece of software if it's anything publish it somewhere it will be useful for someone so now what? <laughs> you published a piece of software, you put it out there. Does anyone care? What shall we do with that? Can we actually bring some sort of change into the world? How much impact can we have through a singular software package? Well, I wanted to talk to you about open source. And of course, this is a hot topic. Uh, I was reading this book, it's called Working in Public, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software by Nadia Egbal. It's a really interesting book. I think it provides quite a nuanced view of the open source ecosystem. Currently, it's not stuck in what free and open source system was uh, in the 90s, 80s. It's looking at how it looks like right now. And what caught my eye was this of classification of production types of open source based on user growth and contributor growth. So I will take you through that. So if a user growth is high and the contributor growth is high, it's called a foundation. And this is the sort of 
typical thing we imagine as open source, things like Linux, or another example, it's Rust, quite a large engaged community that's creating something together. So that's a federation. If the user growth is high and the contributor is low, it's called a stadium because there are so many people and very few maintainers, very few developers. Example of that is, there's quite a lot of that in the JavaScript ecosystem, for example, Babel, which has very few developers, very few maintainers, but Babel is a JavaScript transpiler. But so many people use that and so many other projects use that. So that's called a stadium. The third one, if the user growth is low, but the contributor growth is high, it's called a club. And these quite often happen in various niche communities around these or around various niche programming languages. So personally, I've been a member of the f -sharp community and I would say quite a few projects there are clubs where the users are also contributing to the project. And lastly, if there is low contributor growth and low user growth, it's called a toy. So my question for you is, have you ever open sourced a project? Which type did it fall under? <laughs> okay, so stadium. Federation. <laughs> Club. <laughs> You? Hey. Hey. <laughs> I think we are creating toys. <laughs> and there's nothing with that. Well, the researchers play with them, which is nice. <laughs> and yeah, we can have quite a lot of impact just through creating toys because it's there for reference. But I think it most often looks like this. So quite a lot of our software ends up as a pile of discarded toys that anyone rarely touches anymore. What can we do with that? So, <laughs> I strongly believe that GitHub is where academic open source goes to die. And I was talking to Neil Chuang earlier and he said he has data to prove that. That after putting things on GitHub, there are rarely any contributions, rarely any issues open. Nothing happens. And in some sense, it's fine because quite often it's used as a way to archive the software. It's not used as a living thing. But GitHub is a social network. When I went to the US recently, I had to sort of give them my social media handles and they mentioned GitHub as one of the social media handles they wanted me to fill in. GitHub is a social network. So how can we bring our projects to life? Well, I will give you my two cents. So first thing that I think we should concentrate a bit more on is interoperability. You are probably familiar with the FAIR principles for research data. There is a version for research software as well. Uh, FAIR stands for findable. Well, findable, well, it's cited in a paper or you put it on Zenodo, it's findable. It's acceptable, okay, it's already on GitHub probably, so that's fine. Interoperable, well, it's using some programming language. It has some functions you can call, that's probably fine. And reusable, yeah, I assume you put in some open source license, like the MIT license, and it has some documentation. So is that all we can do? I think that to have any kind of real impact, we should go a bit more beyond that. So I think we shouldn't look at interoperability, but more at composability. Careful when you are writing something like this in a document, it will try to autocorrect it to compostability. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I have little kids, they play with Legos, and they play with Legos that I had when I was a kid, and they are completely interoperable with the Legos that we buy now, because the interface stays the same. So I think we should bring the similar idea into software, can we align with the ecosystem? 
we can look out what are the standards or what big packages use and align ourselves with that. So I think this is helpful to show you an example. Uh, so if you are, my examples will be mostly from machine learning because that's the area that I'm most familiar with. So let's say you are doing some algorithm that will predict something. Well, use the site interface, have the predict function, et cetera. It's, it lowers the barrier for entry for any new users, uh, not just externally, but internally as well. Your collaborators will thank you for that. It might be a little bit more work, but it will make everyone's life easier. And if anyone wants to pick up your software later on, they will have a really good time. If you are doing any deep learning, use uh, Hugging Face. If you are doing anything in R, align that or make it compatible with the tidyverse universe of functions. Uh, my sort of practical examples are SK Time, which is a project that originally came out of the Alan Turing Institute, but now it's sort of out there and it's a standalone independent project. And there they tried to use the same type of interface that Scikit-Learn has, but for time series. It makes it incredibly friendly to any user. And another example, uh, which I think is really nice, are the Palmer penguins. Who knows about the Palmer penguins? A few people. So uh, you pro if you have done any intro course into machine learning, you probably encountered the IRIS data set, which has surprisingly a very problematic history because Fisher published that originally in the annals of eugenics. And in that paper, he discussed the implications into phrenology, which is the sort of measuring of the skull and inferring all sorts of dodgy uh, attributes from that. So uh, nowadays, researchers came out and uh, created a really nice data set that has very similar properties, but is about Palmer penguins. And you measure the flipper length and the bill length, etc. So it's actually much more interesting than flowers, I would say, and it doesn't have a problematic history. And it's a drop-in replacement for Iris. So anything, any demo you have on Iris data set, you can just directly drop in this one. And there are many more examples. I'm sure you can come up with any examples from your area as well. And what can you do beyond that? Well, this is a stretch goal. This is not suitable for every project. But uh, when I did the show of hands, uh, voting what type of project you uh, created or you contributed to, there were a few hands showing for clubs. And I think this is a very good model for some types of scientific software. My examples of existing clubs, even in the original book, uh, they cite AstroPy as an example of a club because it's a very specialized community, but it's a friendly open community. You can contribute to AstroPy. Uh, and the number of users is probably not that different. Well, it's always larger, but the number of contributors is relatively high compared to the number of users. And I think another example of a club is the Turing Way, which is another Turing project where the goal is creating a handbook for reproducible science. And now it's spread out more into the general handbook for collaboration, for building a community, uh, for working reproducibly, et cetera. And one goal of that project is to create a community, to be as welcoming as possible, to welcome contributors to help that make a contribution. So I think this is a very nice example of that. And so this is all nice, this is all existing, this is all working. So how do we move from just interoperable, composable software to something that creates something bigger? Oh. I have two examples from our team. One is from Greg Mingas, which is uh, our research software engineer. And he was working with a couple of uh, academic researchers on a multi-level MCMC sampler. 
And he decided that it would be a good idea to actually contribute that to something bigger. So it's made it into a contribution into PyMC3, which is a big MCMC uh, library in Python. And the academics didn't really care that much because it didn't create any kind of academic impact. But now it's in PyMC3 and people can use that and people do use that. And personally, I think that's more of an impact than just putting a paper out there. And all it took was to reach out to the community, suggest a contribution. Another example is from my colleague, Nathan, over there. Hello, Nathan. Uh, I will probably get it wrong, so please ask, uh, ask him for any details afterwards. But Nathan was working on a project on rough paths where they look at signature transforms. I don't understand those. It's something like a Fourier transform but it captures all sorts of non-linearities. And they were looking at what uh, software to use to implement their model. And turns out none of the available packages were really usable for various reasons. Dependencies, uh, not maintained, unable to install, you know, you know the drill. Uh, so he found a fairly new implementation in JAX, uh, created by a postdoc in Korea, Ang, and reached out to them, put them together with the postdoc or PhD student in Oxford, and that was working on the project. And there is now a collaboration, and they all contributed to the project, and now it will grow into something bigger, because it has more people interested in it. And hopefully this will be the future of uh, signature transforms. So I was thinking about what it reminds me of and it's fast fashion. You probably heard the term. Uh, fast fashion is when you just buy cheap clothes, wear them a couple of times, discard them, never to wear them again. The opposite of that is slow fashion where you care about your clothes, you repair it, reuse it, etc. So I think we are just building a lot of software, then we are then throwing away, never to be looked at again. So my appeal to you is to embrace slow software. Before you open your editor, before you start programming, look what's out there. Try to find out if there's something you could extend, you could reuse. They will kick me out. <laughs> We started earlier. <laughs> so uh, I know it's more work, it's harder, it requires a different skill set. You probably saw Gao's keynote at the start of the conference. It's a lot of people work. There are resources. It's a lot of work, but I think this is a way to have real impact. So just to summarize, try to get recognition for the work that you already do. Uh, think about Lego, not random toys, and embrace slow software. And I have to leave uh, right midway through lunch, so if you want to reach me, I'm at the Turing or on GitHub or, or on Twitter or on Slack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we already have one question. Please do ask more. Um, for RSEs that are not likely to feature in REP, what is the benefit for them pursuing the recognition that academic posts require to justify their existence? Well, if you don't feature in REP, you don't have to care. Uh, I, <laughs> if you don't submit your outputs and you are probably not looking for the sort of formal recognition, uh, you would be otherwise. Uh, so embrace the other ways. And I think we shouldn't just pursue sort of uh, formal pathways to get recognition because quite often the community recognition is much more valuable and a better way to have real impact, not just a formal impact that's only sort of the middle management universities cares about. Okay, I'll start with the first one. Um... But toys help us learn the technology. I'm in a safer environment than other classes of software. Why shouldn't there be a balance between building some toys and some other types? Well, I agree. I think we shouldn't discard toys because they are there to play with. And that's also valuable. Uh, just a note to the story I was talking about the signature transfer. 
Ignatz library actually started as a toy that was out there, but it was sort of so valuable or so easy to use that uh, Nate decided to extend that. So even if some, well, get start as toys because they have very few developers when you put them out there. And it's valuable. I'm, I'm not discarding toys. Uh, and, but I think it's uh, the pathway that I was talking about is not suitable for every project. But it's something to think about when you are starting a project. Thank you. How do we convince academics who pay us to spend money making OS tools that get them no benefit? So if you are working with academics, <laughs> okay, I'm told to, see this, to stay here. Uh, well, one part of the, of the thing is that uh, academics do care about being seen. So if you can put them into the software as well as co-authors, they will be happy that they are on more things they can list on their CV, etc. Uh, but this is why I was talking about doing this as a part of your job. You should try to convince the academics that this is a part of our job because we do have our own expertise. I think we should be a bit more ambitious in our uh, in our work and in convincing the academics that this is something that is part of our job. This is not just something that's extra. And if you are contributing to some package, it's a community standard. You want to help the community. You are helping the academic to get recognized as well, maybe outside of the REF system. Uh, well, if you want to talk about this a bit more, I can put you in touch with Greg, who did manage to convince an academic who didn't see a value in that, in contributing to an open source package. Okay, we have time for one more question. How do the Turing build recognition for the things that you have talked about into their career progression processes? So I assume this is talking about the RSC uh, career progression processes. So first of all, we don't contribute to REF, if I'm correct. Uh, so we don't really care that much about formal publications. And for us, it's not compulsory to have publications. It's not part of our objectives. Uh, the Turing is trying to have an impact. And I think we are doing quite a good job about recognizing alternative sources of impact rather than just academic publications. But then Turing is quite unique in this aspect because we are sort of adjacent to the academic sector. We are not uh, this part of that in the same way that a university is. <laughs>